plowing onward. Check holes half the size of the Maxwell gave J.D. the opportunity to be covered in mud as well as glory. A broken axle, an inexperienced express agent, and the flooded town of Vail all added up to several days of problems and delays. A total of 13 days were consumed getting across Iowa's 360 miles of gumbo from east to west. Nebraska's reputation wasn't too good either. They were towed out of two holes in the distance of a mile. But the water supply shortage was finally remedied by a gift of a jug, the kind that had most likely been used for corn whiskey. Their next problems came with a loosened screw in the magneto plate and the spring on the front foot brake pedal broke. Alice was obliged to get under the auto and fix it with a piece of wire. Upon reaching Columbus, they were finally back on their route as originally scheduled. The Maxwell received a thorough cleaning and wash. The mud had eaten considerable paint from the wheels, which was not noticeable until the gumbo was, was removed and Alice treated herself to a new duster, since hers were showing the signs of trials and tribulations of the trip. Further into Nebraska, the roads had a very noticeably gravelly content, allowing them to run along much more smoothly and make much better speed. The second and low gears had taken over for so long a time that Alice almost forgot that the Maxwell had a third and higher gear. The next delays involved a hailstorm, a broken rear axle, and being delayed because of a murder. As they began climbing the lower foothills toward the mountains of the Rocky Range, the grades were not too great, though some were rather heavy with sand, and Alice thought they were very much like the Montauk Point dunes. After fording a small stream and traversing much barren country, they came upon the high bluff covered in pine trees. Approaching a small railroad station, they laughed at its name, Pine Bluff. The first railroad stop in Wyoming. From there, they saw huge ranches with sheep and cattle. As a matter of fact, their highway ran directly through some of the privately owned property. To keep the cattle in, there were gates that had to be opened and closed behind them as they passed through. No matter how inconvenient it was, no one would think of neglecting this little chore in return for the right to pass. Some parts of this ranch country had fertile fields watered by occasional ditches. They were crude watercourses across which the trail would pass from time to time, and they would have to ford them. At one point, the pilot car fell into one of these irrigation ditches, and they had to use the block and tackle to pull it out. The road was a mere trail from here into Cheyenne. In 1909, Cheyenne, Wyoming was a conglomeration of Indians, cowboys, and cattlemen. However, it was large enough to have a post office, and they were overjoyed to pick up their mail. Contact with home was almost non-existent. That was the worst hardship of the entire trip. Roads in Wyoming were wagon trails, pure and simple. At times, mere horse trails. There would be just two definite tracks, or maybe ruts, often grass grown in between. Then, the scenery began to change and the eroded adobe cliffs 
were a novel bit of scenery to them. The foothills and lower mountains prove much more difficult going up than going down. At one particular spot, everyone had to get out but the driver. Each passenger stood ready with rocks or blocks of wood to place under the rear wheels. The method was this. Give the car the gas in low and pull ahead a few inches. Block the wheels. Repeat the process again and again and again. Eventually, with good power, stout and willing helpers, and plenty of time and persistence, they reached the crest and were up on the plateau once more. They were pretty unprepared for what turned out to be their next hurdle. They learned that it would be necessary for them to obtain a permit to cross the railroad trestle of the Union Pacific near Fort Steele. It seems that the road bridge, which formerly spanned the Platte River, had been washed away during a flood and not been replaced, and the road ended at the railroad. Now this is a previous picture of the bridge that was there. The station master was three quarters of a mile away beyond the trestle on the other side of the river. The problem was to get a permit to do something they would have to do before they could get the permit. A short deliberation and it was decided that Nettie, Maggie, and Hermione would proceed on foot to the station walking the ties and trestle to obtain the permit. Finally, they arrived at the station and Alice watched anxiously for their signal, for the trip must be completed between scheduled trains in either direction. On the signal, Alice got the car into position. The wheels on the left side of the auto had to travel in between the two rails. The ones on the right, on the outside of the right-hand rail, between it and the edge of the trestle. There was practically no ballast, so the routine was this. Feed the Maxwell a little gas, let in the clutch, and bump. Touch the brake, so the bump wasn't so great that it threw her out of rhythm. Then repeat the process. Bump, bump, bump. There were three quarters of a mile of this, one bump at a time. After the celebration and reunion at the station, they proceeded on to the Continental Divide. In this part of the country, they were especially grateful for their pilot car. The road situation was the reason for taking the precaution of having such a leader. It was his job to show them the correct trail in this uncharted land. And with the help of the pilot car, their mileage again was in the 80s. Salt Lake City was one of the most important milestones of their trip. They were able to get mail and have the Maxwell gone over and put into shape for what might be the hardest part of its journey, so far as climbing and the heat were concerned. The land became extremely barren and with many prairie dog holes. It was one of these prairie dog holes that caused their next catastrophe. Upon the Maxwell falling into a hole, the front wheels spread wide apart as the bolt came out of the tie rod connecting the wheels. In the accident, the spring seat had broken away from the axle. After a temporary fix, their friends were determined that they must cross that bad desert stretch, so they drove on. They had left Salt Lake City at 10 a.m. Saturday morning and drove until 3 o'clock Sunday morning. Now remember, Alice is doing all the driving. They took a short break to sleep. Only three hours later, they were roused at 6 a.m to begin again. After a breakfast of dry cereal, canned tomatoes, and coffee at a tiny settlement, they started out. 
The state of Nevada brought several problems and a few solutions. A blacksmith was able to fix the spring on the original axle. A wrong turn cost them a few hours, but maps put them back on the right track, and a South African water bag solved the evaporation problem with the radiator. Here, they also had their first encounter with American Indians. There were about 12 of them on horseback, headed right for Alice and the girls. Suddenly, a jackrabbit leapt across the roadway with its wild pursuers not far behind. It was a glorious relief to know the object of their hunt was a poor desert and animal instead of four eastern females. Their next surprise was in the city of Sparks, just outside of Reno. As they drove over the mountain in the late evening and looked upon the little city, they were all surprised to find the community brilliantly lighted with electricity right off the dark and barren desert. Suddenly they had returned to civilization. Soon after leaving the capital, the Sierra Range confronted them with sudden steepness. The carburetor was feeling the altitude, but the engine kept on pulling. To give the engine even more ventilation, they raised the sides of the hood and turned them back under. It was a noisy, rattling arrangement. It took them eight hours to go 70 miles and then had a puncture in the tire just before entering California. As they entered Stockton the following day, they were joined by a good-sized parade of automobiles. Their occupants cheering the Maxwell, even in 1909, the advertising profession would not have looked with approval on their entrance to the Golden Gate in the hours of darkness. So they had to spend the evening of their arrival in Hayward. Finally, the next morning, the ferry took them across the bay to San Francisco, their final destination. 60 calendar days, 42 days of driving, and 3,800 miles later, Alice made that trip at least 38 more times in her life and was amazed at how easy it became. In 1959, at the 50th anniversary of her historic journey, an article was printed in the New York Times. And in 1960, at the 43rd National Automobile Show, Alice was presented with a plaque from the AAA Automobile Club proclaiming her Woman Motorist of the Century. The Vice President of the Chrysler Corporation presented her with a charcoal portrait and a beautifully composed letter. The Maxwell Briscoe Company was doing very well in 1909, but began a decline in 1920, when overproduction left their dealers with 20,000 cars unsold. Walter P. Chrysler rescued the firm, and the nameplate was discontinued in 1925, when he founded the Chrysler Corporation. Alice Hewler Ramsey died September 10th, 1983, at the age of 96. So, pretty amazing woman, right? And pretty amazing story. So, I, I, I like bringing Alice to you because Nobody had ever told me about Alice. I didn't know that there was a woman that had driven across the continental U.S. at that time period.